This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha, and welcome to What's On Your Mind Hawaii. I'm Tim Apicella, your host. The title for today's show is Five Ways to Clean Up the Money in Our Politics. We've all heard the saying, money is the root of all evil. But in fact, the real verse is, the love of money is the root of all evil. And there's no better place where money is a necessary evil than in politics. Specifically, if you want to win an election, you are going to need a truckload of money and it doesn't matter if you're a Republican, Democrat, or independent candidate. You're going to have to love raising money and spend a good part of your day doing it. Many Americans feel and believe that government is beyond their influence because they don't have thousands of dollars to contribute and therefore their ability to lobby for policy changes is left only for the rich and large corporations. In the past, we've seen successful efforts to reform money con contributions. The 2002 McCain-Feingold Act comes to mind. Thanks to this act, we had better disclosure where the money was coming from and that soft money had its limits. Fast forward to 2009 when the Supreme Court decision of Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission turned our election campaign funding laws upside down and inside out. Our guest today is former U.S. Representative Ed Case, who served the state well from 2002 to 2007. Representative Case recently wrote an excellent editorial in the Star Advertiser on January 7th outlining the ill effects of money in our political system and more importantly pointed out five steps that can be implemented to reverse it. Ed, thank you very much for, for coming on our show and uh, coming on to What's On it's Your it. Mind Hawaii. Yeah, no, it's great to be on. Thank you for having me. I, um, I read your editorial and I thought, boy, what a great topic, uh, particularly in this day and age and particularly given our last election, well, presidential election, and where we are now with the state constitution discussions. So um, well placed, well timed, and uh, thought it was very well written. So well, thank you. Thank you very much. There's a lot of people in the country that care very much about this issue today. Um, you know, it's interesting. You take a look at um, what we all think of our government, and of course we're at an all-time low. Um, some of them for just political reasons, uh, kind of the cycle of politics in and out, but it's really a, what, what is really concerning are two things. First of all, the long-term um, ebb in public confidence in government, and more specifically from my perspective uh, in the United States government and in the U.S. Congress, where I was very privileged to serve uh, Hawaii for five years. Um, that confidence has been going down rapidly. I think when I was in Congress, and that was only about 10 years ago, public confidence was at an all-time low of about 25%. Now we're down to 15%. Uh, maybe even lower. Uh, that's the number of people that have any real confidence in our government. Mm -hmm. Now I can tell you uh, that, that there's a lot of people inside the Beltway in Washington that have a lot of confidence in government because government's doing what they want. So what we're really talking about is what everybody else in this country feels. And what is of greatest concern, which is why I wrote this editorial, is not just the dysfunction in government, uh, not just the inability of government today to get past the partisan divide, not just the deepening and broadening and, and um, um, angst and anger of that divide uh, today. It is really something deeper. It's something that's nonpartisan, and it, it has to do with a, a basic um, um, increased conviction by many people that the actual system itself is broken. Uh, so we're not just talking about Republicans and Democrats mm -hmm. fighting. We're talking about whether uh, we can actually get our government to respond to us anymore because of the influence of money in politics. Let me touch on that one point, the, the erosion of confidence from the American public. And I have to ask the question, did that assist and aid in the election of Donald Trump, specifically over two issues? One was his promise to drain the swamp, but two, the allure that I'm not receiving campaign funding from lobbyists in big money, I'm using my own funds to uh, basically pay for my election expenses to become president of the United States. Did that, do you think those two points had a, an allure for not maybe uh, for the independence of this country or maybe even middle of the road Democrats? Well, I don't, I don't think about it in partisan terms. I think that many, many of the elections today, not just in the federal uh, side, but in the state uh, governments as well, and this is proving out all across the country, 
they're not about Republican versus Democrat. They're really about insider versus everybody else, about mm -hmm. outsiders that feel that they have no place in government anymore. So you talk about President Trump, but I could just as easily give you the example of Senator Sanders, mm -hmm. who was running the same campaign as Donald Trump, but on the other side of the partisan divide. So why did the two of them uh, really overcome so many of the naysayers, so much of the inside political judgment about how they were going to do? One of them, of course, won the presidency. The other one came pretty darn close to winning uh, a Democratic primary. He was given no chance of winning. Um, why? Well, I think it's very, very uh, obvious, and, and uh, you can't reach a different conclusion than that. That was driven by a large part by what I talked about earlier, was just a, just a, a lack of uh, faith and, a, and, a, and, a, and an erosion of confidence in the system as at least it's practiced inside of Washington today. Mm -hmm. Describe the ill effects that, you, as you see it, um, of, of money or too much money in politics. Well, let's start with a basic, and I always want to go back to this at the very beginning. Um, I don't believe, and I don't think most Americans believe, that lobbying itself is wrong. In fact, if I want to go down and petition my government, that's one of the basic rights that we have, you know, the ability to petition our government, and that's lobbying. Um, and I don't, I never minded when I was elect, an elected official for, for 12 plus years if somebody came to ask me or tell me what they thought I should do or what we should do. And it didn't affect me uh, particularly whether they were paid or not to do that. Uh, it was my job to make the decision. It was their job to try to convince me. And so I think that lobbying itself is a right and we don't want to get rid of lobbying. I also think that it's my right uh, to contribute uh, to, my, to my candidates and to my members of Congress if I want. And, and the that's never been an issue. So this is not about the basic right to lobbying and money. This is about an over-influence by both inside of government today. And the ill effect can be seen a lot of different ways. Um, you know, uh, one of the obvious ways that I wrote about in my editorial is that you have members of Congress going back to Washington and, you know, we're supposed to be going back there to legislate. We're supposed to be going back there to, to you know, study policy and to, and to hear from people on what the right decision is and to and to sit through committee hearings and, and try to grind out the, the compromises that are necessary for our government uh, to work. And that's all takes a lot of time and hard work and energy. And that's what you should be doing in Washington, D.C. But increasingly, because of the drive of money in politics and the drive to you know, get money and spend it in campaigns, um, you find legislators that are going back there um, as, as I was when I first went back there. And I went back there 15 years ago now. And the advice to me was, you know, okay, when you're in, on the ground in Washington, you should spend 25 to 50 percent of your time not legislating, but raising money and talking to lobbyists who have a lot of money to contribute to you. So, you know, every Wednesday morning, every Wednesday afternoon, go down to the local call center and just dial for dollars. Um, that's a day taken away from legislating. That's not a lot of fun, is it? <clears throat> I mean, I'd rather sell encyclopedias back in 1958. Uh, door to door <laughs> than dialing for dollars for a political campaign. <laughs> I don't really know of that many members of Congress who like doing it. Um, it's it's more a matter of um, you know can you, <laughs> how much can you tolerate it? I mean, some run for the hills from it, and some are quite good at it. And I've, I've you know I'm somewhere in between. I guess I I have no, I have had no problem calling up people and asking them to contribute to me. Uh, but um, when I'm doing that all of the time, when I'm forced to do that all the time then that's a problem. <clears throat> the second problem, of course, is simply that that money is going somewhere. That money does not come free. That money comes with um, expectations, with, with um, um, preferences, and it's absolutely inescapable that if you have too much money, you're gonna get influenced the wrong way. I don't think people understand to what degree that pressure of influence, what the form of that looks like, specifically. And you know, we all know that there's lobbyists, and lobbyists have influence, and requests, but how does it come about? How does it actually m meet your desk and... Um well, let's say, I, let's say, let's say that, um, let's just take a, a, a fairly blatant example. Um, <clears throat> probably one of the best um, systematic and deepest pocketed and deepest influenced uh, lobbying groups is the pharmaceutical industry, Big Pharma. Mm -hmm. um, Big Pharma just doles out a ton of money on both sides of the aisle. Now, um, every once in a while, an issue comes along that that's their number one issue. You could take uh, Medicare reform when I was there, healthcare uh, reform, 
Um, you can absolutely bet that there are special provisions in that bill that wouldn't have been there if that money had not been contributed. So Do they write legislation and then you then politicians review it and say, I, yeah, I changed this or changed that? Do they actually take the authorship of legislation? No, I mean, they don't take authorship, but they offer what they think <clears throat> should be um, the legislation. And I don't have a problem with that, by mm -hmm. the way. I don't, I don't have a problem with somebody uh, coming to me and saying, um, hey, I'm trying, to, I'm, I'm trying to achieve X, and here is some language that would achieve it. Um, I have no problem with that. It's not my job to just accept that carte blanche. So if you're, if you're a legislator that is accepting that carte blanche, and I say that that's wrong. But if I'm taking it and sifting it and saying, OK, do I agree with this? You know, is there a better way of doing it? I got no problem with that. It's the system itself right. that presents the problem. Because when you spend all of your time um, um, responding to the pressures of political fundraising and money, and when you spend all of your time dealing with the lobbyists who contribute money inside of Washington as opposed to worrying about what's you know, going on in the rest of the country, um, and when the uh, system is, um, is uh, uh, responsive only to big money, that's when we have a problem, and that's the problem mm -hmm. today. Just big money. I mean, I'm not going to mention big farmer or whatever, but is there ever a situation where big money will sit in your office and, and threaten you if something doesn't go their way? You know, Either implicitly or explicitly? Um, well, the implicit threat is always there. Um, you know, you're always... Uh, um, How do they suggest it, implicitly? Uh, they, you know, the, 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 the great lobbyists, they never suggest it. Yeah. I mean, they're, 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 they're just too smart to do yeah. that. Um, but, you know, hey, come the next campaign, the next election, you voted against them. On, well, you might find that you're not getting a contribution from them anymore. It's very subtle. Right. Um, it's, you know, I mean, I can count on, you know, one hand the number of overt threats I got. What did uh, that feel like? What did that sound like? Get out of my office is the way I felt yeah. about it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll listen to you, yeah. but don't threaten me. Um, so you've actually received, if you don't do this, I'll do this. Very, very, very With few times. So yeah. I don't want to mm -hmm. represent that, right. that. You know, it's not, it's, it doesn't go down the way that most people think. It's, yeah. it's a lot more subtle. It's a lot more um, you know, indirect, mm -hmm. uh, but the influence is there, uh, and the and the responses to the to the pressure valves of that are there. Yeah, um, I want to read a quote from Senator McCain, John McCain's um, 2002 memoir, and um, I, I think you know he used to be a, a big leader in ca campaign reform, mm -hmm. and uh, this was interesting. This is just taken out. Of, I didn't have the whole entire quote, but it says. By the time I became a leading advocate of campaign finance reform, I had come to appreciate that in politics, suspicions were not always mistaken. Money does buy access in Washington, D.C., and access increases the influence that often results in the benefit of a few versus the expense of the many. Well, that's fundamentally how most of us feel right now is that we don't have a seat at that table that the decisions that are made are, are only really explainable if you explain them as as decisions tailored to a very small group and very influential group and almost always a large moneyed group. Um, and that has been what has driven the um, confidence in our government to a low. And <clears throat> my problem and the problem of, of other former members that I've joined with in the, in the Reformers Caucus to, to try to, to, try to you know, show the light on this a little bit more um, is, is that it's one thing to have the problem of dysfunction but we always have believed that our democracy was strong enough to right itself. That our democracy, you know, like a ship in a storm, it would come back to an even keel or be inclined to an even keel. It would be corrective action that could be taken by the American people, the American voters, to, to rise up and say that they didn't like what was going on and that you would, you would have, you know, on occasion political revolutions over, over um, non-responsiveness from government. Um, and the problem here is, for the first time in my life, I question that. I question whether um, the, 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 the circuit is so closed that it's very, yeah, very it's difficult to, re it's yeah. not going to be solved simply by yeah. you know, re electing some more Democrats or more Republicans. That's not the solution. You belong to a group, which we want to talk about right after this break, called Reformers Caucus. And so we're going to take that break. I'm Tim Apicella with former Congressman at Case, and we'll be right back. I'm going 
to the game and it's gonna be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink but won't be drinking today cause I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line, keeps them from drinking too much so we can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way cause it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you wanna be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O and I'm the guy that says let's go. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Aloha, welcome back to What's On Your Mind Hawaii. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and I'm here with for former Congressman Ed Case, and we're talking about money and politics. And before the break, um, Congressman Case basically was talking about a group that he belongs to called Reformers Caucus. And so, Ed, would you kind of talk about that group and its mission and um, where it's been and where it's going. Sure, well, um, the Reformers Caucus is a, a um, organization of now almost 200 former members of Congress and governors who all feel the same way about uh, wa how Washington is working and the decline in confidence in the, by the American people in, 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 in the Washington generally and in Congress and specifically. And so a couple of years ago, really, uh, uh, this group started to coalesce around uh, um, the idea that, that um, <clears throat> this was issue one. And we call it issue one. And, and all of what I'm talking about here can be found on a website, which is issueone.org. Um, and we believe that issue one is money in politics. And we believe that issue one is um, the um, the, the reforms that are necessary to try to curb uh, the excesses that we believe have occurred and the damage to the country uh, that has occurred as a result. And so um, this is a very, a very fascinating caucus. Um, many of the people in this caucus you would readily recognize, people like you know, former Senator Bill Bradley, um, some of the real lights of the House, I mean, you know, some others like me who Former Sir, Speaker Tom Daschle, I believe, is part of that. Uh, uh, Majority Leader Tom M Daschle me, on, yeah. on the Senate side, uh, and many and many um, House members and and governors, uh, you know, by, on both sides, by the way. So if you if you take a look at the uh, political spectrum mm -hmm. of the members of this caucus, <coughs> you'll go from far left to to far right. How long has this um, caucus been in? A couple of years couple now. Of years. Um, it is it is it is growing. More and more former members are joining it. Um, the, um, I think it's about half-half Republican Democrat at this point, and we're doing what I'm doing here. We're, we're we are trying to you know highlight the issue uh, back in our home our home states or or elsewhere. We are trying to um, encourage the Congress itself to uh, uh, do some common sense reforms that we think will will assist uh, the process. And so we're you know we're 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 using the. The, um, I guess the bully pulpit of our former offices, uh, to the extent that any of us have that bully pulpit, uh, to to try to uh, tell the American people that uh, hey, you're not alone. A lot of a lot of people that were there inside feel the same way. And um, what is the reception um, that this caucus is receiving? Uh, specifically, are you getting uh, airtime <coughs> on, on media avenues? Increasingly, um, increasingly, yes. Um, and the caucus has now morphed a little bit into the next stage, which is a more active presence inside of Washington. Uh, so, uh, for example, the caucus, uh, together with other like-minded uh, groups and people, will put on presentations and and uh, conferences. Uh, there's a conference coming up, for example, in in March, where many 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 members of the caucus will come and. And uh, the, the media is uh, paying more attention to this uh, reform effort because, first of all, it's incredibly unusual to have a caucus like this around any issue. You mm -hmm. know, I, I really can't. I've never that. really heard of it. And I'm, I'm going to assume that you haven't hired a, a lobbying effort to lobby the existing Congress. Well, uh, <laughs> well there, are, there are people that are um, 
not form of members that are part of issue one that are mm -hmm. dedicated to <coughs> this particular issue. And again, there's the there's the example right there. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with with uh, right. with any of us lobbying Congress to try to get congressional reform of lobbying. That's that's fine. That's fine. That's not a contradiction. I mean, you've already done that because you just told me before we went on air that actual existing members right now have formed their own caucus. And what has Let's happened as a result? About well, that a um, bit. What is and, and just in the past couple of months, we've seen the formation of a caucus inside of Congress, so consisting of current members of Congress uh, that um, agree with us and that are are willing to um, um, introduce bills that will implement the policy um, uh, directions that we want to take to try to reform uh, try to reform the system. Uh, that caucus is a very small caucus so far. And you know, in all honesty, that tells a little bit of a story because uh, we as former members are not in there. We're not having to go chase bucks and you know, uh, deal with lobbyists. Um, and so to some extent, we have the freedom of expression. Uh, but inside Congress, of course, you're still reliant on that system uh, for the, you know, the money to win your reelection. You mentioned the freedom to kind of opine about things that you normally wouldn't be able it's to do. It's a great, it's a great. And <laughs> I'm looking at Senator Flake, I'm looking at um, um, other Republicans that have decided not to run again, and yet now their, their opinions about things are far more, um, how should I say, aggressive about what they feel and what they believe than before they were going to try to get reelected. Yeah, you know, and that's a little bit of the uh, that's a little bit of the the tragedy of the system in a way because uh, um, the system does does tend to get you to stifle yourself a little. Too. I, if I look back at my time in, in office and focusing on Congress a little bit more because I was quite outspoken as a state representative here in Hawaii, uh, but as a as a member of Congress, I was a uh, I was a little more careful to mm -hmm. um, you know be measured in my criticism and and tones and to. And you know, part of that was just learning my way in the system and trying to make sure that I was, you know, critiquing the right things. And part of it was uh, that that you know, one of my jobs was to, to was to um, obtain what Hawaii needed, and that didn't take standing on the floor of the House and screaming. But I tell you, if I, if I had it to do over again, I think I'd be a little bit more vocal. I, I think you could have it, have your cake and eat it too. I was going to say, um, <clears throat> if there's an effort of from this. Uh, the membership's about 20 congressmen right now, and, and I'm sure it's going to grow. I hope it does. But given the reluctance to um, be a little bit more outspoken, what's the chances of success of, of, of legislation moving forward that would limit the power of lobbyists? I think, um, I think you know, the funny thing about um, reform um, is, is, and I've, I've been through various types of reform in my, in my legislative career, you know, you, you, think re, you think about reform as kind of this gradual process. That's not how reform happens. Reform is like a lurch every once in a while. You know, it, it's, it's, it's like a rubber band. It builds up, but then sometimes it just snaps. And then you have the opportunity for reform. You talked about Senator McCain earlier, McCain-Feingold, and you, you recited that as, as, rightly recited it as an incredible leap forward in terms of campaign finance reform. Um, if you had asked anybody six months before that happened whether it was going to happen, they would have said, I doubt it. So that snapped like that. <laughs> so I'm hoping that by mm -hmm. building this pressure from the outside, we are hoping, by building, you know, by, by, by people, uh, for example, here in Hawaii who might watch this show calling up our members of Congress and saying, hey, I heard about this Reformers Caucus. I really want you to support it. And, you know, we've got, we've got a full, uh, you know, year of candidates here, uh, including a, a, a first congressional uh, seat. If that's an issue in that election that it's talked about, the candidates have to deal with it and, and commit to it, then that's, that's a small success. So the five points that you mentioned in an editorial of how some reforms could look like, uh -huh. um, did that come as a result of the caucus, the reformed caucus, or is that just kind of something you, you, you believe strongly No, I in. think, you know, we, 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 all, we all got on the yeah. same page. We mm -hmm. all agreed. Uh, we all, you know, we all believe in a fairly, uh, a, a common message, and we believe that there are categories that we have to deal with right. in order to, in order to um, um, achieve reform. Well, let's look at uh, some so of those categories. Sure. I think the one that caught my, well, they're really very basic principles, but they're very, 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 Im the impact is very, very powerful. And I think the one is everyone participates. And, um, that's quite a concept. I mean, that's not happening. 
they're, we're at 15% confidence of right. the American public because right. they don't feel they have a voice. Right, so, so there's, there's, a, there's a number of principles here. Uh, everybody participates, uh, everybody knows, everybody plays by the same rules, um, everybody is held accountable, and everybody uh, has a voice. Those are kind of the categories, and they're, they're, they're commonsensical, but to tip, tick off some of the realities uh, and what we hope to achieve in those areas, everybody participates is about, hey, you know, um, the system is being overwhelmed by big contributions. Uh, small contributions just get lost in the in the shuffle. And is there a way that we can, uh, you know, uh, give a preference, give a benefit, give a credit, give a, um, um, a, a an incentive uh, to small donors? Because um, you know, and again, you, you have examples from the last campaign where small donors really wrote um, a lot of the books on these, uh, so it can work. The, well. Senator Bernie Sanders' campaign really was all about sure. small small donations. Senator Sanders fund, funded an <clears throat> entire successful, um, even though. Did he, you did, the, did you find that surprising that he was that successful? I did not, um, and that be, the reason is because of what we talked about quite mm -hmm. early. Because I think that there is just a building, um, you know, frustration in the country uh, by most of us uh, that's directed against the inside of the Beltway, and so um, I think that outside candidates at both the federal and the state level um, have a lot more of a chance uh, today. Uh, people will give them a lot better look. Um, so he just happened to be. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in some in the right sense, place, the right, at the right place, time. Exactly, yeah. and uh, you know, Senator Clinton, uh, for all her incredible achievements, was was painted as that insider, right. and, and that's. And really she had the access to a lot of these institutional dollars, if you will. Well, she she was a benefit of big right. money. That's, right. There's no question about that. Um, everybody um, knows. To me, this is probably one of the most important parts of our package, because we don't know today who is contributing The transparency money. issue. That absolutely, transparency is a critical. Which was overturned by Citizens United versus the Federal Election Committee, right? Well, what, what has really happened here is that, you know, if you, if you want to go back and say, okay, what's, what's the right system here? What, what balances our right to lobby and our right to contribute against the, the, the problems of excesses of lobbying, excess of, excesses mm -hmm. of contributions? And, what you will find pretty fast, and you know, we've already done this in McCain, Feingold, and other um, laws, is reasonable limits and full disclosure. That's really what it comes down to. That you know, you can contribute, but you can't overwhelm uh, the system. And the U.S. Supreme Court has said it's completely legal to have reasonable limits. That's never been uh, questioned. Um, transparency that. If I contribute, everybody knows that I contributed. And that's an incredible problem right now. Citizens uh, United basically stood for the proposition that um, corporations um, in their own right can contribute. Now, I disagree with Citizens United, but it, um, so that, the problem there is that there's mm -hmm. no limitation on corporate contributions, mm -hmm. which wipes out most of the American right. people. The real problem is the combination of Citizens United with, um, Dark money, soft Dark money. money. Um, I wanted to get into all that, and unfortunately, we're running out of time. And I also <laughs> wanted to talk about the ill effects of Citizens United Supreme Court decision. And I'd love to have you back on the show again to talk more specifically to those points. Um, we have run out of time. I can't thank you enough for coming <laughs> on the show. And I wish you very much success, not only with the, the caucus, but your, your other endeavors trying to reform our system. And, you know, um, we owe a tip of the hat to you. So well, thank you very thank much. Thank you so but much you for know, coming on our show. Just, it's not just one person. It's, it's, it's 200 right now and a, another 20. 250 million people need to say this is enough. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I'm Tim Apicello. This is What's on Your Mind Hawaii, and I'm here with former Congressman Ed Case. Aloha.